Well, hello and welcome to Trending Treasury, the webcast brought to you by Arling Close. Each week we take a slightly less formal look at everything related to Treasury, from investments, debt and everything in between. Before we begin, if you don't already, please do make sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, where you'll find details of our upcoming webcasts, as well as links to the Arling Close blog. Notable recent articles include a discussion of leisure providers and their risks, and there's another one that's uh, all about things to consider when undertaking due diligence. This week, I'm joined by Dr. David Green to discuss the Public Accounts Committee report on local authority commercial investments. Uh, should be an interesting one uh, and very relevant to most of our listeners. David, thanks for joining us. Uh, um, lockdown's being relaxed. Uh, what are you looking forward to getting back to doing? Uh, much like a holiday in cottage booked uh, in the Cotswolds uh, two weeks tomorrow. So very much looking forward to actually spending overnight somewhere other than my house. That's time yeah, yeah. As um, I think everybody's starting to feel that uh, not the wall, not quite at the walls closing on on them just yet, but certainly uh, a change of scenery uh, would do everybody a bit of good. I think uh, I'm certainly starting to think that uh, a holiday needs to get booked as well. Um, so um, the Public Accounts Committee. I suppose uh, we've got a very grand title about this inquiry into local authority commercial investments. But it's probably for some of our listeners, uh, it's a, a relatively uh, not a, a not very well known function of government. So I suppose the best place to start is what is the Public Accounts Committee? Yeah, it's a select committee of Parliament. So it's not part of government, it's part of Parliament. And it's, the, it's a bit like a scrutiny committee at a local authority, I guess. Um, and it's the committee responsible for the finances of government. So it often scrutinises HM Treasury, but it's a wider remit to scrutinise how public money is spent across all departments and all public services. Uh, it doesn't look at government, so it doesn't look at local authorities individually or other public bodies, so it can criticise government departments, but it doesn't have to be critical of a particular local authority, and I think we see that in the report today. I see. Um, I see. Following on from the report, what formal powers does the Public Accounts Committee have? Can it sort of censure people? Can it order people to do something in particular? Or, or is it more of a, you should be doing this? Yeah, I get the impression it's very much an uh, advisory committee, but it's, it's always described as the influential Public Accounts Committee. Uh, I think it's quite rare for people not to follow its recommendations. Um, but yeah, I think it needs a vote in the House of Parliament to actually Mm. So it's looked into, so if it's sort of seen as influential and government departments tend to pay, pay what it does quite a lot of respect, um, we can expect there to be some uh, consequences from the report. I mean, has it, has this or any other committee looked into local authorities before recently? Yeah, I mean, in public council committees looked at local authority governance, um, local authority spending, you know, is parliament giving the government enough money? To spend on public services, um, so but then again, it wouldn't wouldn't look at the distribution between local authorities. But it's always always looks at local government in the round. Uh, obviously, the Ministry of Housing and Local Government Committee looks at local government in much more detail. And spends most of its time on local government issues. Mm. So I suppose to move into you know, we've moved on from what the Public Accounts Committee actually is, but. Thinking specifically about this inquiry and the report that's come out of it, why was the Public Accounts Committee looking into local authorities and commercialisation in the first place? What what was sort of the big bang on this? Yeah, there's a National Audit Office report. Uh, we've been two actually into this area, into the commercial activity of local authorities. Um, the first one a couple of years ago prompted and it's easy to sort of change its data collection a little bit. I think sort of your capital expenditure reports that you send back to government, the COR capital outcome reports have been amended a bit and asking for more detail. But not a lot happened, and that's led the certainly purchases of commercial property by local authorities have increased continuously. And that prompted the NAO to write a second report uh, published at the start of this year. And the Public Council thought, yeah, this something needs to happen here. 
I see. And so what what was the inquiry's remit? I mean, what was it what was it really trying to look at? I mean, I presume it wasn't just commercial property investments. It was it was uh, commercial investments uh, overall. Or have I misunderstood that? I think it probably started off, you know, commercial activity. It's focused on the six point six billion pounds worth of commercial property bought by the government over a three year period. Um, but you know, it certainly mentions what it calls innovative, innovative types of commercial activity, so income strips, loans to third parties, joint ventures, set up companies, uh, investments in renewable energy. Uh, particularly mentions it says it there was a history of local authorities entering into commercial arrangements that initially provide benefits but subsequently cause widespread concern. I mean that particularly references the um, inquiry into Lobo loans that we uh, was held a few years ago. Anyway, it's, it's worried that local governments are taking on long term liabilities, long term commitments, possibly that for the understanding of what it's doing. And also maybe that what individual authorities are doing might be fine, but it's creating risk for the sector as a whole. You know, if every local authority does the same thing, that creates a huge exposure. And in the end, central government won't let public services fail. Some still needs to provide social services, highways, etc. The government would have to step in. So really central government's taking a lot of the risk, but local authorities are getting some most of the return from it. And it's sort of addressing that. Uh, more hazard issue, if you like. I see. So, very much of the belief that local authorities sort of can't go bust, and and if they can't go bust, or if they, more accurately, probably from what you've just said, won't go bust, there is a a sector issue in the sense of if there's you know, commercial property, one one authority going into commercial properties is one thing, but everybody going in is is quite is quite different so presumably when they looked at these risks and looked at the risks that have been taken there was a view taken on oh, I don't want to say whose fault it is but where this why that uh, local authorities have gone in for this and, and how they have been able to was there any particular criticisms or uh, any particular um, organizations that came into uh, came, came in for it with the with the inquiry report yeah, and it's very much focused on the government department, the Ministry of Housing Communities and Local Government, or MHCLD for short. Uh, probably that's partly what the committee's focus is, so it's not really, it's not allowed to criticise individual local authorities. It, it mentions a few in a report as examples of, um, of activity that's gained uh, notoriety, but it doesn't criticise them directly. So really it's on MHCLG to and some of that is about CLG actually being clear what it what is fine and what isn't. So sometimes we hear that borrowing to invest is illegal full stop or is wrong full stop. But then other times CLG says there's only a small number of councils who are doing this disproportionately. So they're happy with people borrowing to invest in a small way, but not borrowing to invest in a big way. But then they don't give what the boundary is between small and large, small and big. You know what is a disproportionate level of compliance activity, which makes it easy for people to believe they're complying with the framework and for other people to believe they're not complying with it. So yeah, certainly CLG is taking most of the blame here. This does give recommendations for SIPTA as well, so sipta has got part to play in the financial framework. It does seem to be quite difficult though to defend MHCLG a little bit it's quite difficult you've got on one hand you've got a very strong localism agenda which we've had uh, we're, we're a decade into it now so i don't suppose that um, a civil servant is going to make themselves particularly popular with the minister if you bring them a statutory instrument to sign or a, a piece of legislation to put through parliament which limits the powers of local government when the agenda has been quite the opposite and also it's quite difficult to say what's proportionate, I agree, but commercial property investments, investment properties by local authorities are nothing new. Uh, this isn't something that's happened, that, that six billion over the last, uh, over the last th uh, three years is certainly eye-catching, but it's not what you might say unique. You know, I mean, I've been doing this job for a, 
for a little while now. You've been doing it uh, slightly longer than me, David. You know, you've known that local authorities have had yield bearing assets and assets that are really only for yields for a very, very long time. So it seems to be maybe the it's easy to criticize, but actually when you drill down to it, it's quite a difficult thing, a, a tightrope to walk from XCLG. Yes, I mean, I think certainly local authorities have held commercial property for a long time and earned rents from it. I think the activities of borrowing to buy new commercial property is certainly a relatively new thing. Um, it's a thing that you could invest your own money, maybe, but you couldn't borrow someone else's money to invest. Um, but as cut, grant cuts have you know, come in and the government directly is sponsoring local authorities less, and often ministers say there should be more commercial. You know, a lot of local say, hey, well, yes, that's what we're doing. We're generating income from other sources and being more commercial. This is how we're doing it. But it's a balance, isn't it? What might be right for a local authority individually, but if 400 authorities are doing the same thing, then it becomes a risk to central government. Because uh, obviously, what's happened for the last couple of months with COVID has brought a lot of those risks into sharp focus. You know, uh, a lot of shops will be paying less rent this year than they're contractually obliged to do. Probably quite a lot of uh, shopping centres have not going to look as commercially viable as they did when they bought in recent years. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The, the COVID response, this is, as you say, it's brought everything into sharp relief. But again, perhaps to play devil's advocate um, a little bit, one might say, well, nobody is suggesting that local authorities lose their role as makers of place. Nobody is suggesting that local authorities shouldn't be able to borrow to invest in their local area to develop uh, the local area and to improve that. Now, part of that is going to be you know, developing assets, then funding the repayment of that through you know, the, the rental payments by the future tenants, etc. One might say, well, actually some of the risks that have been noted by this uh, this report are pretty inherent in local authorities doing anything in their local area. So are we down again to this idea of, that you've mentioned a couple of times, it, it's really about the scale. It's about if local authorities were doing small, uh, not small, not necessarily small, but doing policy-led projects in their local area, that would be one thing, but they're doing policy-led projects and they're doing no, I don't. I don't like the term personally, but these debt for yields projects. Yeah, the debt for yield is you know is more concerning than uh, debt for regeneration, shall we call it? Uh, mm. Even if regeneration generates the yields to pay for the uh, pay for the borrowing in the first place. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's scale, isn't it? Really, and I think and the fact that a lot of local are doing the same thing. So you know, a lot of them have bought shopping centres, for example. So, whereas you might, you know, normally a portfolio of commercial property might be quite well diversified. Taking what all local authorities have bought together is rather less diversified um, sector wise. I mean, certainly very well diversified geographically, of course. Uh, although, even then, actually saying that, a lot of the activity is in the south east of England. A lot of the local authorities with the biggest portfolios are based in the south east. You know, property rates tend to be higher. Yeah, understandably. So, I mean, we know that um, MHLG are the ones that have really come into the criticism. Looking a little bit to the future now, what are the main recommendations of the report? Uh, obviously, as we've said, they've they've got no formal powers, but it's very unlikely that this report will be ignored, and it's extremely probable that any recommendations will be at least in part taken forward. So what are the major recommendations from a both a local authority point of view, but also from MHLG's point of view? Yeah, I guess you can split them into two things. Some of the uh, recommendations are a bit soft. So MHLG should be clearer about what is acceptable and what's not. Is borrowing to invest on a small scale okay, or is borrowing to invest wrong completely? Uh, and actually, we shouldn't rely on external audit so much to look after local authorities. You know, 
keep them on its own to address failings in governance of commercial investment activities. And CLG should be uh, providing examples of good practice and criticising examples of bad practice publicly. I think CLG really hasn't called out any particular authorities. This is what the committees recommend they do. So those are some of the softer uh, aims, softer recommendations. But I think interesting, and the ones that probably affect local authorities the most, MHCLG should review the MLP guidance and consider whether its statutory basis should be strengthened. So as most listeners will know, MLP is the way which the principal cost of capital schemes that are funded by borrowing, the way that principal is charged to revenue over time. Currently, that is uh, statutory guidance, the guidance that you have to have regard to, but it's not the law, so you don't have to follow it. And quite, there have been some cases of local authorities buying commercial property and they're saying, well, actually, we don't need to make any MRP on this, we can make MRP of zero, and that is still prudent because we plan to sell the property at a profit one day. So putting MRP back on a statutory basis, um, there used, used to be 4% cost, uh, sort of 4% reducing balance cost to more capital schemes through MRP. Uh, they could, could put it back to that level. They could maybe say, well, actually, we're happy with sort of more of a 50 year lifespan, so 2% per annum is a minimum. And so that could be a, quite a big difference for local cultures that are using normal MRP policies. I mean, that could be a really a really big impact because most changes in law, most changes in guidance are not retrospective. But an MRP change, obviously, if it's changing the requirement for you to finance principal payments, if you've gone, you know, if you've had over the last three years a very, very low level of MRP or even zero on some big ticket items, the sudden requirement to pay those, to make MRP payments could have a very significant issue on the revenue budget. This isn't going to be just a capital issue or a or a, a reduction of income issue. Um, is that am I right in saying that? And could this could actually uh, call into question the profit profitability or the of any kind of these of these assets? Yes, I agree. I mean, they won't retrospectively change MRP that's been made in the past, but what they can and they, they did change the last time they updated MRP guidance. They changed the MRP you have to put away in the future on past expenditure. You know, and of course, at a time when property values have fallen due to the recession that we're having, you know, you may find that holding it is a big cost and selling it is a big cost as well. So yeah, statutory MRP would be uh, a big thing for local governments. Mm. And ironically, I mean, some of the, we, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to uh, name names, but some of the the big uh, names and that have been in the news that have been subject to investigations by the press are actually authorities that have big commercial property portfolios, but who are putting MRP aside. So it could be that it doesn't, that sort of thing doesn't affect some of the big names, those you'd expect, but actually it's some smaller authorities or or less or authorities that have been less in the news that actually find themselves struggling so it's quite interesting to bring it back to some of the softer recommendations you mentioned especially around calling out uh naughty authorities which seems to be uh one of the recommendations that that's there this idea that mhclg should be openly critical of individual authorities they're going to have to be quite careful about that surely if you criticize an authority that's going to put them in the news that's going to uh, have have a quite a big impact and if your criticism is uh, strong and you're but also well founded then that's one thing but criticizing an authority without fully understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it could be i don't want to say a recipe disaster but it could have some quite unpleasant intended consequences yeah, I mean, this is why CLG needs to first of all be clear what is acceptable and what isn't. You know, I think it needs to bring up a very bright line between two, you know, can do and can't do. 
and then it's much easier for you to criticize people who are doing what it says they can't do uh, but you know because it is quite gray area um, and this is also addressing the other hard recommendation about to review the potential framework and not just MRP that's clearly part of it but to address to the wider and um, the potential code the investment guidance from the government um, the response from Ireland close to the committee, we actually highlighted a lot of the inconsistencies between various pieces of guidance. So, you know, sit for accounting code, says that property is only an investment if it is solely for financial purposes and provides no services whatsoever. The SIP for prudential code says, uh, sorry, the SIP for treasury management code says it's an investment that's mainly for financial reasons, but can be partly for services. The government code says the other way around, it's an investment if it's even partly for financial reasons, even if it's mainly private services. So does OHCLG mean that a school which you built a new school building knowing that you let it out at the weekend and that would help pay for it, that's a partly for your property, that's an investment, or you're not allowed to borrow for that? And I think that, that's not really clear. And of course, all this about locals must not borrow in advance of need. But what's the need? I think most people think the capital funds requirement is the need to borrow. So buying a commercial property increases that capital finance requirement. Borrowing for it is borrowing within CFR, is borrowing within your need. You know, but MHCLG and CFR obviously think differently, but they need to say what is need. So I think that's what we would expect to see under a proper review of the framework. Going forward. I think that could have big implications as well as to what is permitted and what's not, especially if that becomes yeah, defined in law as a what is permitted and what isn't. Yeah, it feels like um, I remember when I started my career, everything was going towards localism. Uh, you know, to repeat myself from earlier, you know, there was a big localism agenda that we've had, you know, trying to give authorities more flexibility to act in. A way that's appropriate for their local area not a one-size-fits-all approach and what actually seems to be happening now is that um, perhaps some of that is being rowed back the idea that actually MRP should be a statutory requirement perhaps that there's a specific amount that minimum that you should be paying as you say you know the tightening up definitions that have perhaps been I don't want to say intentionally vague but have certainly allowed a lot of flexibility for authorities to interpret the guidance in a way that they think is appropriate for their local situation is almost being taken away the eye or at least suggested that it's been taken away that these things as you say in order for mhclg to make these interventions they need to be quite clear on what is and isn't acceptable and some of the gray area is going to be removed that's going to have again a knock-on effect um one thing i did want to mention uh, was the um idea that they should uh, develop and rapidly deploy interventions that target uh, extreme risk taking it'll be quite interesting to see what they see what mhclg comes out as extreme risk taking i mean i think we can all agree that uh, local authorities have taken on more risk over over the past probably more like five years but do you i mean i mean I, without again without going into examples of specific authorities I, I'd, I'd struggle to think of anybody that's taken an extreme risk or, or perhaps that's my my lack of knowledge but and what would the, what do you think those interventions could look like i guess within the current potential framework there's the ability for the secretary of state to impose an authorized borrowing limit on a particular local authority and, you know, there's local authorities who are looking to borrow another billion pounds next year for commercial activity. I can say, well, no, you can't. Your borrowing limit is now only 100 million higher than it was last year. I guess that's an obvious one. Um, maybe they're talking about installing commissioners, you know, actually removing the power of councillors to make decisions in certain areas. You know, they've done that with um, uh, child safety in local authorities in recent years. Uh, and done it in some areas for nearly taking all powers off councillors and then slowly handing them back. You know, so quite easy for them to take away 
the ability to make investments or to, to buy a property away from councillors and install that with a, a group of small number of commissioners and certify the ministry. I guess that would be a certainly a rapidly deployed intervention. But you're quite right, Stephen, it's what is an extreme risk? But is it just a, a big risk? I mean, it's um, it's interesting, really. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to need to be defined quite clearly, because I could imagine an authority that was put into some sort of measures attempting to challenge that decision by saying, you know, if you don't, if you don't clearly legislate for what an extreme risk is, if you don't clearly legislate for whether your guidance is mandatory to follow or whether it's just guidance that you have to have uh, you have to be aware of and have to take note of if you don't get those things in order first it's quite difficult to legitimately intervene in the way that the public accounts committee um suggests um just to finish off before we we go on and we've had a few questions to uh to to deal with some of those questions and for those of you listening please Please do type into the chat box if you've got any questions. We will have some time at the end. Um, it seems like, and it's quite a, a boring point, but it, it seems like there's going to be a lot of data gathering for MHCLG if they follow this advice. That's going to have a knock-on effect of local authorities. Is this going to... I've got a horrible, a horrible vision of the future, David, where MHCLG doesn't really follow any of the guidance except for... Um, miles and miles of paper for local authorities to fill in and, and not and not really anything else because they're required to collect all this data and then they don't actually do anything with it. Yeah, I'm not too I mean local government fills in a lot of data for central government already. I think probably smarter data collection, your those capital expenditure returns, you know, it doesn't ask is this property for commercial purposes is this an investment or not yeah. i think it's asking those sort of sensible questions as well the nc is really on about so um, clearly we want to avoid extra form filling i think it's just making current forms ask the right questions oh okay well i think we've covered everything we uh we wanted to cover but we have had uh, a couple of, of questions um whilst we've been talking uh the first one is do we expect this to have an impact on on pooled fund investments so obviously local authorities invest surplus cash normally in and if it's surplus for a long period of time then it could be then they'll invest it in assets that are appropriate for long-term investments such as pooled funds do we do we think that they could be caught in the uh, in the aftermath of this, I think that's certainly not the intention. So um, we've actually mentioned the Treasury uh, consultation on the people of the beaver that's actually very closely tied in that annual debt for yield, uh, and that's mentioned in the PSE report. I think this is that's very clear that normal Treasury management shouldn't be affected. Um, the problem is, and the PSE identifies this, is that if your uh, if your investment is capital expenditure, and then you can borrow for it within the CFR, so I think that's the um, that's the key area really. It wants to avoid it wants to avoid capital investment and by borrowing. If it's investment uh, in a pooled fund that is not capital, then you can't borrow for that, and there's a natural limit on what you can do there that, that is kept proportionate by the size of your reserves and working capital really. It's where you can borrow to invest that the problem is. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's my feeling as well, that that if it does get caught by this, it will be an unintended consequence rather than anything that the Public Accounts Committee was considering, considering doing. Um, one, uh, one question we've had was around uh, this idea that uh, chief financial officers or uh, other or, or other senior officers are in some way reluctant to challenge councillors or challenge other senior officers uh, when they want to make these decisions that 
there should be a, a more a more of a willingness to speak truth to power or something like that do you think that that's part of this or is or is i mean to be honest i disagree with that a little bit i think that local authorities have been looking at innovative ways of funding themselves and have have come up with what they've come up with but do you think there is more of a, a role for um the chief financial officer in this and maybe part of that statutory strengthening could be to expand on the requirements of the section um 151 officer for example Definitely. i think in the end councillors are elected to make these decisions so it's not the role of officers to um you know stop councillors doing what they want to do but it is very much the role of officers to point out the risks you know given an open and fair assessment of what could go right but what could go wrong uh, I think that's spelled out very clearly and members still want to go ahead then that's that's fine you know that's their on their heads be it the members can be uh, un unelected or deselected uh, the officers can't I suppose this all comes back to the point that you made at the very very beginning which is you've got local authorities which are by definition you know it's in the name the clues in the name they're local making lo making decisions with their money but there's a certain degree of uh, you know the the income and the benefits are taken by the local authority but the wider sector risk is taken by central government and by everybody so there is a sort of a question of well if you're asking cfos to say no to a certain extent in it's it, who elected you but equally well it's not just your local people's uh, money that you're putting at risk by making these uh, commercial decisions potentially so i think it is an interesting an interesting area and it and it almost throws up a a philosophical question about w what is local government and um, why do we have these splits and who where should the risk fall i mean i don't think uh, anybody's eager to go to an american style you know, cities going bust and uh, the and the sort of federal government allowing that and the local people accepting the the issues that comes with that but equally there is a a, a strong dichotomy between as you put it at the start you know this the the impact of the sector risks on central government and the individual decisions that individual authorities are making so it's quite it's food food for thought and it'll be interesting to see what what comes out of it longer term indeed yes well i think we've got no more questions um so i suppose all that there is to say is uh thank you very much for for joining me david um it's been a as always your uh, your knowledge is uh been invaluable to me and i'm sure to our listeners uh, for those of you who uh, don't subscribe to the do, who don't subscribe to the webcasts uh, on a regular basis uh, please do uh, if you email workshops at hardingclose.com you can sign up and you don't need to uh, request individual signups uh, every week um, and as i said at the start please do follow us on sh so social media to uh, to be kept up to date with all of the interesting things that we uh, we provide to both clients and non-clients. So, all that uh, all that requires me now is to say goodbye and good luck. Cheers. Bye, everyone.